You know how to go right to the chase. (laughs) (laughs) This is Dr. James Tabor. He is a retired professor in the Department of Religious Studies of over 33 years. Since retiring, he now devotes himself full-time to research, archaeological fieldwork, and publishing. I have one question for you, uh, Dr. James Tabor. What on earth does Jesus have to do with the Dead Sea Scrolls? Okay, David. You know how to go right to the chase. Uh, uh, well, you're going to take, take the course and learn. I, I like to say it's uh, two very big words. Jesus, obviously, the J word. But Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, everybody's heard of them, but very few people have read them. And I mean, just people out and even people that follow our channels and study a bit, you know, they might be able to tell you about when they were discovered, 1947, you know, 75, six years ago, and a few things. But if you ask, well, have you ever read them or looked at them? So in this course, we actually look at the scrolls and we we answer that question. And here's how I'm going to answer it to you. I, I've got a list here uh, that I'm going to read you. If I describe to you, David, and listen to these 12 characteristics, you know, one way you understand Jesus or This group is, what were they all about? What did they teach? What did they do? Take a listen to this. An apocalyptic messianic group, they're preparing the way in the wilderness. In fact, they consider that their main mission when you ask them, what are you doing? I'm the voice of one preparing the way in the wilderness. New covenant. Talk about a new covenant. Children of light. They immerse in water. They're not Greeks, so they wouldn't call it baptism, but mikvah. But not just for ritual purity like all Jewish groups at the time, but they're immersing in water to enter the group as an initiation to be born again, really, into the group as one of the children of light. They have a prophet or a teacher that they think is like a new Moses. They emphasize the Holy Spirit. They have a council of 12 and an inner council of three. Okay. They sell their possessions and live communally. They consider the Jerusalem temple a den of thieves and the priests a brood of vipers. They believe that their prayers are their sacrifices and that they as a people are the true temple of God. So that's 12 things I mentioned. Is that Jesus? (laughs) Or the Dead Sea Scroll community? It sounds like Jesus. It sounds like Jesus to me. It is Jesus, but it's also the Dead Sea Scroll community. Now, that's not to say that there are no differences. I gave you the similarities, but these are big. And let me say Mm. this. This is kind of dramatic. Heard of Pharisees, Sadducees, the other groups. Mm -hmm. Essenes sometimes mention, and I'll talk about that in a minute. What do they have to do with the Dead Sea Scrolls? But let's take Pharisees and Sadducees. Not one single thing that I named of these 12 would apply to a Pharisee or a Sadducee. So if we can profile a group in such a specific way, these are not minor things. These are literally like, what are you doing? What are you about? What do you believe? Who is your leader? What's your Mm. mission? And Jesus and the Dead Sea Scrolls fit all of those. Now, they have their different ideas about them, and we delve into that, of course, in the course. So what are they, really? It's a library of a sect unknown to us unless Josephus, when he describes the Essenes in his Jewish War Book Two, has them in mind. And that's one of the things we do in the course. We read what Josephus says about Essenes, And then we compare it to the actual scrolls. That's the question I get most often when I lecture. Uh, Dr. Tabor, were these Essenes? And I always say to them, what's your definition of an Essene? If that's your definition, these 12, I'll go with Essene. But guess what? Josephus probably mentions about three of these. He goes more for their rituals, like they immerse in water. He says that, and they separate from other people. He doesn't say they're preparing way in the wilderness. He doesn't even say they're apocalyptic. He doesn't say they're messianic, waiting for the messiahs, any of that. So, you know, as seen maybe, but the point is this really stands out. It's a library of a sectarian group, as they're usually called, a sect of Judaism, 
that we might have known something about through Josephus and Philo, the ancient mm. uh, writers of the first century, under the name Essene, but now we've got their writing. So it'd be like hearing about Jesus later from a person describing Jesus uh, or the movement, like Tacitus, the Roman historian, he describes the early Christians. Pliny writes to the Emperor Trajan and describes the Christians. But that's a lot different than reading, say, our Gospels or the letters of Paul. So it's yeah. like we found their New Testament, you might say, if you understand what I mean by that. Because we got their actual mm -hmm. writings. In the case of the Dead Sea Scrolls, guess what we have? They follow a teacher. We don't know his name. I think we can date this teacher to maybe about 100 years before the time of Jesus, maybe 150 years. We don't have an exact date for him. We don't know his name, but they call him the teacher of righteousness. That's what you're going to hear most. But also, it can be translated the true teacher, meaning the right teacher. There are a lot of teachers. Rabbi means teacher. This is the true rabbi. And so they clearly think he's the one. They say about him that God has revealed to him all the mysteries of the prophets. So this is an amazing figure to them mm. who's like a new Moses. And again, the new covenant and so forth. They think they're the children of light. They think everybody else are the children of darkness. They think the end is coming near. So the scrolls are their library. It's about 1,800 volumes. But in some cases, we might have just a fragmented page like the background page behind us. That's a rather complete scroll there. That's probably the community rule, which was their charter document that we study in the course. But lots of little fragments, some the size of like your fingernail. But they could represent, if you have enough lines, oh, well, this doesn't come from any other place. This could be part of another book. So we estimate maybe five to 800 volumes are in the library, found in caves around the Dead Sea, the lowest spot on earth in 1947 through 1952. So it's pretty exciting. First of all, how could things be preserved for 2000 mm. years? For example, they have a copy of the book of Isaiah called the Great Isaiah Scroll. It's complete. All 66 chapters as we number them today got some significant differences and i have a whole lecture on that you know how does the Whoa. dead sea the bible they're reading how does it differ from the bible we're reading because our oldest copies of the hebrew bible are the masoretic text as it's called dates from about 1000 i've got a copy right here the leningrad codex that's the oldest copy of the hebrew bible that we have well now we got a copy of isaiah that goes back a thousand years, maybe 1200 years earlier. We think it might be around 100, 200 BCE. So the first thing you want to do, of course, I mean, when you get into the course, it's it's so exciting because you're like, well, I want to know like, well, how does that Isaiah differ from the Isaiah that I can read yeah. in any standard English translation? Uh, so even these fragments though, we talk about some of the fragments. Now, let me explain something. When I started graduate school way back when, I shouldn't date myself, but it was in the 1970s. <laughs> Here's the book. This is the book I used for the Dead Sea Scrolls. And then a few years later, when I started teaching, I know they look almost the same, but this has a few more scrolls in it. And then I got this one. I got this one probably in the 80s as I was starting my career. And then I got this one so you can see what's happening. Now, I'm going to pull this out. Look what I have now. This is what we're going to use in the course. So in 1991, all the unpublished scrolls were released in photographs. It's taken us a while. You know, that was over 30 years ago to process it all. But one of the lectures is on the newly released Dead Sea Scrolls. You say newly released 30 years ago. Well, lots of people haven't even read them yet, the newer ones. So look at the difference, you know. Look at this. Whoa. So we want to ask what's in those scrolls and how does it make a difference? We want to keep up with uh, the scholarship and what's going on. And I happen to have been at Qumran. That's the ancient ruins of the settlement where this group lived. Caves around it where the scrolls were found. I was actually there for a month when the photographs were released, working with Robert Eisenman. And Robert Eisenman and Herschel Shanks, the editor of Biblical Archaeology Review, released all the photographs. And finally, anybody that could read Hebrew, you know, could begin working on the scrolls, which I did right away. 
had a little jump on everybody else, I guess, because I was over there. But uh, that's all past, and now I'm looking back after all these years of teaching, and I want to share with a wider group. My students have just loved this material for decades in all of my courses. Hmm. I taught at William & Mary, Notre Dame, UNC Charlotte uh, the last 33 years. So uh, I might be older than I look, I don't know, but uh, here I am and I've got this experience that I wanna share with everybody, including you and all of your viewers. So I, and also the course is just packed with material. I don't know if Derek Lambert has filled you in on that. You know, I say 10 lessons, you have all of this supplementary material, articles and PDFs. You've got a course pack that's over 50 pages of material for you to study through and read. All of my notes, I've, I've put everything that I do, even in a graduate course, uh, into this. Now, when I say graduate, I don't wanna scare anybody. I'm not gonna grade you, there are no tests. I'm talking about the breadth and depth of material, the richness of it, and that you're getting the very best of what I can offer as a professor who's taught this material for years. So that's kind of the overview. I hope it whets everybody's appetite and get the course. The other thing is I'm gonna do Zoom meetings with all the students once a month. Since we're just releasing the course uh, in September, uh, today, September 18th, when we're recording this, uh, I'm gonna wait till October, but the last Sunday of October, anyone who signed up for the course is invited to a Zoom meeting. And I don't mean a webinar where you watch me talk. I mean, we all gather together with our little, you know, thumbnail images of ourselves on a big screen and we can talk together. I'm gonna have q and I'll get Derek to come on if he can, and we'll just explore all these things together. And uh, you, you signed up for the course, so you, you can be there, David. Well I, well, I definitely will be. You know, when I when I completed ministry college back in, I think, 2009, I was told that we found the Dead Sea Scrolls and that it showed that the Bible was 100% perfect and nothing had been changed. So I'm very interested to learn a different, uh, I guess, uh, perspective on these uh, yeah, ancient I, texts. I saw you perk up when I got to that point. It is an important <laughs> point. And, you know, you could emphasize either way. What you usually hear from apologists is, oh, we found these copies of Hebrew Bible scriptures and they're 2,000 years older than what we had that's 1,000 years uh, later from 1,000 AD or CE. And it's basically the same. Well, yes and no. It's sort of like Bart Ehrman <laughs> teaching New Testament and holding up a critical New Testament, all the variants, you know, with all mm. the differences, some of the books he's written and saying, you know, it's basically the same. Well, it is basically the same. Like if you're reading 1 Corinthians, it's 1 Corinthians. But what if you have 10 or 20 significant variants in the manuscripts where it mm. changes the reading or the ideas behind the text? So some of them are slight, they don't even matter. It could be a way you spell a word or just an extra phrase put in that isn't that important, but other times it makes a huge difference. And we cover that in the course. But overall, wow. just to have this, uh, one other thing I didn't mention I wanna throw in, there is a scroll, we do a whole lecture on it called Who is the Teacher of Righteousness? I can't give his name, approximate date, 150 years before the time of Jesus, but, we think we have a hymn book that he wrote. And in that hymn book, we call it hymns. You don't sing them. They're poetic writings. We think he wrote about a dozen of them himself because they're very personal. They're first person. And he talks autobiographically. Can you imagine wow. if we had that from Jesus? You know, our gospel oh, that, written incredible. decades after. What if we found a document where it says, I think this is written by Jesus of Nazareth. It's a, it's, it's some meditative thoughts that he had. That would just be like the greatest discovery in Western history as far as the history of religions and culture goes. Well, we have that with this teacher. Most of us who work on the scrolls are convinced that the Thanksgiving hymns, they're called, are composed partially, if not all, by the teacher, but the core maybe like a dozen or so absolutely by him because they're very autobiographical. He talks about his birth and his parents and things like that, which you wouldn't do generically if you were just talking about people in general. So that kind of gives wow. you an idea. And That is, I, well, 
I'm I'm definitely going to be there with bells on as soon as I can. That is very exciting. Guys, if you want to sign up for this course, the link's in, in the description. It's the first link at the top of the description. Uh, join me. I'll be there, uh, and I'll be there in the Hangout. So it would be awesome to, to um, see the community um, take part in this because this is incredible stuff. This is not a course you want to miss out on. Uh, and as you can tell yourself, this is incredible. Thank you, Dr. Tabor, for taking the time uh, to Thank you answer very my much. question. It's, uh, it's been a pleasure. I really appreciate your time. Thanks.